Are you tired of bulky wallets that just take up space in your pocket, sticking out of a jacket or out of your trousers? It's not nice. Well, look, meet the Ridge Wallet. This is a wallet that has over 50,000 five-star reviews and it is built to last. It can hold, oh, this one is, this is the one I used to use. Right now I'm using this black one. It can hold up to 12 cards, although right now I've got like three in there, you know, two credit cards and uh, then my driver's license, which is kind of what I roll around with. But if you go on more, it can hold more easily. Plus there's lots of style choices. This one, like I say, I'm using at the moment, the aluminium black. Previously, I've used the burnt titanium. Burnt carbon? Burnt titanium? Burnt titanium. That's what this one's called. It's got this cool, like, burning effect on there. And then previously, I was using this one. I'm not sure what this is called. Carbon. Ah, this is the carbon one. That makes sense. Look, there's a style of Ridge wallet for everyone. If you're worried about digital pickpockets as well, don't worry. RFID blocking to keep your information safe. Plus, it's durable and it comes with a lifetime warranty. And if for any reason you don't love it, you could test drive it for 99 days. And then if you're like, ah, it's not for me, return it for a full refund. And look, if you're looking for even more organization, why not get yourself one of these? It's the Ridge key case, which kind of like, it's like a pen knife. The, you slot your keys in there. It's actually surprisingly easy to do. Just a little screwdriver. And then all your keys are in there. And they're not jangling around like, hey, crazy. These are all my work keys. Just easily on this thing. I just get to work, flip it out, open the lock. Boom. And now look, Ridge is celebrating their 10-year anniversary. And there's a limited time offer. You can save up to 40% off your purchase through March 26th. Just go to ridge.com slash criminalist and stock up on durable space-saving gear that you'll actually use. So why wait? Upgrade to the Ridge wallet and the key case today and see the difference for yourself. Go to ridge.com slash criminalist. There's a link below and now to today's video. His music was once the soundtrack of a generation, but his crimes would forever tarnish his name. Meet Gary Glitter, the rock star who fell from grace after being convicted of horrific child sex offenses. From the height of his fame to the depths of his depravity, this is the shocking story of a man who shattered the illusion of celebrity and exposed the darkness lurking beneath. Discover the chilling details of Glitter's crimes, the impact on his victims, and the ultimate downfall of a once beloved icon. And with that, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. Today's criminal, uh, I think this one's somewhat timely, at least at the time of recording. Maybe I'll push it through production a little quicker so it reaches you guys. But um, at the time, I think Gary Glitter was released from prison last week after spending a long time in prison, and this was not his first time in prison, as I just I didn't really know much about Gary Glitter. I knew he was like a sicko and that he was in prison, um, but that's kind of it. I think this was, I don't know when this happens, but it was probably a little bit before I was reading the news. Anyway, let's just jump in. The format of the show is Dave, uh, one of my writers, has written me a script. I'm going to read it. I've not read this before, so let's just jump in. Rock and roll. Although the concept of celebrities misusing their influence over others in order to cover up horrific crimes is not exactly new, widespread public awareness of these crimes has only really become prevalent within the last 20 years or so. Thanks to things like Operation U Tree and the Me Too movement, it is finally becoming harder and harder for those who abuse their celebrity status to get away with it. In today's episode, we will be looking into the first celebrity who was arrested as part of Operation U Tree, a massive police investigation that was set up after the appalling revelations regarding Jimmy Savile were first reported and the subsequent collapse of this vile individual's career. So please join us as we take a deep dive into the rise and the fall of Gary Glitter. Born on the 8th of May 1944 in Banbury, England, Paul Francis Gadd, better known as Gary Glitter, was one of three boys born to Rita Gadd. The result of a one-night stand, Paul never knew his father and spent the first 10 years of his life being raised by his mother and grandmother. Gadd would later say of his mother, she was an unmarried mother, and in those days, society didn't accommodate it very well. But she did her best for us. I adore her. Sadly, though, her best was not enough, and at the age of 10, Paul and one of his brothers would enter the care system. Not much is mentioned anywhere about his brother, but it has been reported that Paul was impossible to control, and even at a young age, he was frequently engaging in antisocial behavior. As is so often the case, the care system was not particularly beneficial to Paul, and he would later came, claim, while trying to defend his actions in court, that he had suffered sexual abuse while under its alleged protection. From the age of 12, Paul would frequently run away from home in order to visit London's music scene. It quickly became clear that he had a talent for music, and by the time he was 14, he was regularly performing at such venues as the Two Eyes in Soho and the Laconda and Safari Clubs, where his mix of early rock and roll covers and melodious ballads really drew in the crowds. 
kind of impressive for a 14 year old wow it was during one such performance that gad caught his first break after coming off stage he was approached by film producer robert hartford davis best known for his work on the fiend and incense for the damned two movies that i would be prepared to bet that simon has never heard of and you would win that bet dave harford davis was so impressed by gad's performance that he agreed to pay for a recording session with decca records and so it was that at the age of 15 under the stage name paul raven gad released his first single alone in the night unfortunately for him this and a few other subsequent releases were not particularly popular and gad would end up taking a job warming up the crowd for the popular show ready steady go it was during this time that he received his second musical break whilst working on the show he met songwriter and producer mike leander who offered him the opportunity to front the mike leander orchestra who just happened to be embarking on a uk tour with the bachelors at the conclusion of this tour and hoping to build his growing popularity gad formed paul raven and the boston international show band along Alongside John Russell. Whilst working the London clubs, they were spotted by a German promoter, Bruno Koschmeider, who offered them a one month contract to come and play at the Kaiser Saal in Hamburg. Is this what happened to the Beatles? Didn't they perform like in Hamburg for ages and got really good at music? Although the plan was to return home after the one month contract had ended, the Boston Internationals were so tremendously popular in the German club scene that they remained there for five years. <laughs> Damn, after like one month contract turns into five years? I know I had one shot and I blew it, all right? During this time, the band worked with such notable musicians as Little Richard, Bill Haley, and Jimi Hendrix. Big names. Gad would also briefly experiment with the alternative stage names of Paul Mundy and Rubber Bucket. Despite the fact that Gad was finally starting to make a name for himself, his true rise to stardom hadn't yet begun. Even though their previous endeavors had not proven particularly successful, Gad and his friends, Mike Leander, still believed that they had the ability to create something truly special. When Gad returned from Germany, the pair took advantage of some free studio time which had been made available due to a cancellation by David Essex. Out of this studio time, Gary Glitter was born. I'm not sure, so I'm wondering now. Like, <laughs> am I like, how did anyone not realize he was weird? His name was Gary Glitter. Like, or am I just doing that in my mind because retrospectively, I know that Gary Glitter's a weirdo? And so I associate anything that sounds like that with weirdos, with weirdoness. Whereas, like Jimmy Savile. <laughs> also, how did anyone not look at Jimmy Savile and be like, that guy's a sicko? Like, look at him. Look at the way he dresses. Look at his weird face. <laughs> He's a pedo and we know it! And he was! On the 3rd of March 1972, Gary Glitter was officially unleashed upon an unsuspecting public. His debut single, Rock and Roll, was quickly picked up by the burgeoning disco squirt scene and made it to the number two spot in the UK with over a million copies being sold. Now, now he's suddenly super famous. Gad was invited to perform on Top of the Pops and Leander thought that the appearance would be considerably more impressive if he was accompanied by a large band. With this in mind, the Gary Glitter Rock and Roll Spectacular was quickly assembled. This ensemble featured bassist John Springgate, guitarist Gary Jerry Shepard, drummers Pete Phillips and Pete Gill, and sax players Harvey Ellison and John Russell. These musicians would later become the Glitter Band. Gad's next single, I Didn't Know I Loved You Till I Saw You Rock and Roll, released in October 1972, was almost as successful as the first, reaching number four in the UK charts. Now, fully embracing the glam rock image and competing with such top bands as T-Rex and The Sweet, Gad would continue to heap success on top of success. 1973 would see him achieve the number two chart spot with both Do You Wanna Touch Me, Oh Yeah, and Hello, Hello, I'm Back Again, as well as two number ones with I'm the Leader of the Gang I Am and I Love you love me love i don't know if i know any of these songs i don't know if i know a single gary glitter song and i'm not gonna go look it up on spotify afterwards because gary glitter's a sicko on top of all of this his touch me album oh my god in retrospect some of these names right now spent 35 weeks in the charts and he embarked on a world tour visiting the uk germany australia france spain italy holland belgium scandinavia and austria okay. thanks for the specificity dave <laughs> get to know all of the countries he went to in such detail do you want to name the cities as well oh that's sarcasm <laughs> that is awesome <laughs> sorry that's unnecessarily harsh shortly after this he would travel to america to record the gg album this album would help kickstart the career of then hardly known luther vandross who provided backing vocals am i supposed to know who luther vandross is i guess so oh, that's weird 
Although arguably some of his best work, the album was not well received by his hardcore fan base, and he subsequently suffered a minor and temporary drop in popularity. After announcing his retirement from live performances in 1977, he relocated to Paris, where he kept a much lower profile. It's been speculated that he used this time to deal with the various cocaine and alcohol habits that he'd acquired during the previous years. This period of comparative solitude ended when he was offered the part of Frankenfurter in the New Zealand production of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh my god, Rocky Horror Picture Show is so bad. And everyone's like, not everyone, but it's got such this hardcore group of fans who are like, oh my god, it's amazing, and we go to the cinema and sing along. And I'm like, it's sh It's garbage. I can't believe anyone likes this. It's like Pink Floyd's album. Just another brick in the wall. Shut up, Pink Floyd, you suck. And everyone likes you because they think it makes them cool. That's the only thing that I feel Rocky Horror Picture Show has going for it. So for some reason, there's some people who think that liking it makes them cool somehow. I don't understand it. I think it's crap. And I don't care what your opinion is. <laughs> Somebody's in a mood. No drinking. Rant's over, let's carry on. He would go on to spend some time living in Australia before returning to the United Kingdom in 1979 and relaunching Gary Glitter. Am I thinking that he spent a time in prison in Australia? I feel like, you know, when he got released from prison, I heard about all his, like, stints in prison. He was definitely in prison in Asia for a while. I think he also did prison, he obviously did prison in the UK, and I think he did some prison in Australia. If I remember, I'm not sure. He's committed crimes all over the world. His world tour of criminality. The public were as willing to adore him as they had previously been in the 1980s, and this heralded another period of success for Gad. Securing advertising work for Heinz Soup and British Rail kept his face in the public eye, and he achieved several more hits with songs like Dance Me Up and Another Rock and Roll Christmas. He would frequently perform in front of sold out crowds and even managed to get his own late night show called The Leader Speaks narcissistic much according to <laughs> i'm gonna launch a, a new youtube channel the god king speaks how am i gonna pull that off what the f gary glitter according to an article on nostalgiacentral.com <laughs> The famously reliable source, NostalgiaCentral.com. One of the few places on the internet that I always find anything positive written about gas. <laughs> oh god, why NostalgiaCentral.com? Uh, Gaza succeeded. Don't call a convicted sex offender a nickname like Gaza. Jesus Christ, NostalgiaCentral.com. Gaza succeeded because I feel dirty even using a nickname like that. Succeeded because he was more of a showman than a rocker and he refused to take his image seriously. He took his music seriously, however, and worked and worked and worked on getting his music and his image across. Gary was probably the most unlikely teen idol ever. Paunchy, past 30, and with a 50s throwback bouffant quiff, he took glam rock's job description to its giddy limit with an outrageously hairy chest encased in a rhinestone and glitter jacket, painfully tight silver foil trousers, and the flashy and orthopedically dangerous high heels, which made Mr. Glitter the most imitated act of the time. But nobody could get near to the exciting productions of Mike Leander, which showcased Glitter's talent so well. What is wrong with you, NostalgiaCentral.com? Not only is this weird that you're like, Gary Glitter's a Amazing. It's also terribly written. It's just bad. I could barely get through that. Why would and worked and worked and worked? That's not writing. That's like what a seven-year-old would write. How was school today? It was really, really, really good. What are you doing? You're in a mood. No, I'm not. At this point, it appeared that Gad had it all. Not only was he a household name, but he had a devoted fan base and sky-high credibility. This meant that even during the 90s, when glam rock became less popular, he still had no trouble drawing in the crowds. It really did seem that he would maintain a reasonably high level of popularity almost indefinitely, which is very hard to do. There's not a lot of like celebrities who have ongoing continuous popularity it's something i always think about <laughs> like you don't want to be forgotten you don't want to be left behind because that's what like happens to most people i mean not that i'm a celebrity but you know what i mean like i rely on people looking at my stuff in order to uh, make money and live so i often think about that i appreciate your protectiveness simon but the integrity of the work gives it a durability that can sustain such things part two the colossal fall from on high in November 1997, Paul Gadd took his laptop computer into a Bristol branch of PC World for repair. Oh, oh, oh no, is this how he got caught? Ah. What the? <laughs> it's like, it seems there's something wrong with my computer. I am sorry, mate. It's, uh, it's not got enough space on the, uh, the hard drive because you filled it up with kiddie porn, you sick f 
The technician who subsequently examined the device discovered that the hard drive contained thousands of indecent images of children. Oh my god, can you imagine being like, you'd just be like, Oh, what have I seen? Why? Oh god, call the police, Jeff. What? And that is an image you'll never forget. Like, you're looking there and you're like, ah! Oh! And then... <laughs> PC technician in Curry's is not exactly the job where you expect to have trauma. The technician reported this to the store manager who immediately phoned the police. Unaware of what had happened, Gad was waiting in store for the repairs to be carried out when the police arrived. Gad was arrested, questioned, and released. The police would later carry out a raid on both of his properties, during which time they would discover further images along with videotapes containing child pornography. Gary, mate, what are you doing? <laughs> it's like you get released from prison and it's like, nah, they're probably not going to raid my house and find all the other chill, uh, kid porn, are they? It's going to be fine. Dude, you should have, like, I don't want to give advice to sick f***s like this, but you should have an incinerator on site, dude. Like, what the f***? You need, like, one of those, you know, in, um, is it Argo? Where the, the Iranians are taking over the US Embassy and they're like, burn it all, burn it all now! And they're like shoving things into incinerators and shredding documents. That's what you needed, Gary. You don't just need to go home and have a sit down. <laughs> Although you do. Don't actually do that, because I prefer you in prison. As soon as the press got wind of this, Gad's popularity vanished overnight. <laughs> <laughs> Except with NostalgiaCentral.com, allegedly, apparently, in my opinion. One article published in The Guardian the day after his London home was raided said the following, Gary Glitter last night faced a humiliating end to his 25-year career as one of the most colourful characters in pop after child pornography was allegedly discovered at his London home. <laughs> Guardian's calling it there, calling it early. It's like, I get the feeling this could be the end of his career. <laughs> Guess what, Guardian? You were bang on. Unbelievably, Gad would release a statement claiming that he had done nothing wrong, and a spokesman would later say that the 25th anniversary tour, which was planned to start just three months later, would definitely still go ahead. I get the feeling that that's not going to happen, Gary. <laughs> As it transpired, neither of these things were true. <laughs> On the 12th of November 1999, Gad would appear at Bristol Crown Court, where he'd be sentenced to four months in prison and forced to sign the sex offenders register. Is that all? I guess it, I, if he... That does feel very light, doesn't it? For having, like, lots of kiddie porn. Come on. When asked during a later court appearance, during which he was accused of much more serious crimes why he had downloaded these images, he gave a somewhat confusing explanation. I was drinking heavily. I was doing drugs. And the other thing, of course, is that I had to find this money to pay for the legal costs and studio, and I was asked by my management to seriously do the one thing that was absolutely terrible, which was to sell my songs. To sell my songs to Universal Pictures, and I regret it. I was in just a bad place. I went to prison, I came out, I was remorseful, and I am remorseful. I am so sorry. It changed my life forever. I lost my honor. I lost my family. That's his explanation. <laughs> That's not an explanation. That's just you saying that you were in a low place. <laughs> you know shit normal people do when they're in a low place? Not, not what you did, Gary. <laughs> not what you did. This, in my opinion, provides very little in the way of an explanation. It would appear that I am not the only person to think this. Prose yeah, me neither, and I'm betting this prosecutor. John Price QC, uh, whilst cross-examining Gad, simply responded to this bizarre non-explanation with the words, You will accept that people have difficulties in their careers. You will accept that they do not reach for their laptop and look for pictures of men having sex with young children. I think Gary's response would be like, No, that's what, that's what people, that's what people do. What are you talking about, QC? Oh my lord. It is worth mentioning that he was cleared of one charge of having sex with a 14-year-old girl during the 1970s. The validity of the accuser's claims was brought into question when it was discovered that she had received a large pay payout from the now thankfully discontinued News of the World newspaper. News of the World, whenever you're brought up in any context like this, it's always because you're doing something mega shady. What, what, why? Why, what's happened? Why, you, why have you made this payout? It also came to light that if Gad was convicted, she was contracted to receive another, even larger payout. Oh, I see. Oh, I'm sorry, it was the other way around. I thought that it was they were hushing it up somehow, but that would make no sense, because they're a tabloid rag. They pa were paying her for her story, which is definitely a little bit of a conflict of interest there, right? Because they're paying her for a story that she's very financially incentivized to, to well, let's not say make up, but, you know... <laughs> I'm not going to say that, but you could probably also follow my logical thinking here. I'm not in any way suggesting that her claims were false. In fact, given the evidence that we shall shortly address, I suspect that her claims were completely legitimate. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess it does make sense because it's Gary Glitter. Uh, that being said, it might perhaps have been more prudent to wait until the court case before approaching the tabloids. By the time Gad had been released from prison in January 2000, he had become an object of public disgust. <laughs> Shocking. I know he did a lot worse sh 
because I know he went to prison for a really he went to prison I think he just got out from like an eight year stretch which was like down from 16 or something so uh, he did we know he did some more disgusting stuff Having already received multiple death threats while in prison, he decided that remaining in the UK may be very well detrimental to his future existence. Fortunately for him, he possessed a rather nice luxury yacht, which was at that time located in Spain. And it was aboard this yacht that he elected to spend the first six months of his freedom. Probably a smart idea, Gary. Just go live out in international waters um, and uh, never come back. Just, just go. Maybe someone could drop some food off every now and again. You could just live on your, on your luxury yacht and just not interact with society. Just see it as a, as a little prison you can go to, and that's probably where you should have stayed, Gary. After his six months period of rest and relaxation, he spent some time in Cuba before moving once again to Cambodia. Wait, he moved to Cambodia before? This is the first time we mentioned this. He was about as welcome in Cambodia as he was in Britain, according to an article on Billboard.com. Although he committed no crimes in Cambodia, the impoverished Southeast Asian nation's Minister for Women's Affairs led a campaign to kick this out on the grounds that his presence sullied the country's image. Yeah, it does. Gary, get out of Cambodia, you sicko. He was deported to Thailand in 2003 before finally settling for a while in Vietnam. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking, like, these countries are not exactly not known for potential sex crimes against children, are they? I wonder what Gary Glitter's doing in these countries. <laughs> he, if he simply remained in his rented seaside villa and kept to himself, that may very well have been the end of his story. <laughs> it's not gonna be. He's gonna spend some time. I'm pretty sure he goes to somewhere prison in Asia somewhere. As you may well have guessed, this is not what he did. Whilst engaged in the process of applying for Vietnamese residency, Gad was brought to the attention of the authorities after he was banned from a nightclub for allegedly touching a teenage waitress in an inappropriate manner. As the police began to investigate this matter, several witnesses came forward to complain that they were they had seen Gad taking two young girls into his villa. He left his villa for the last time on the 12th of November 2005, presumably to avoid any inconvenient meetings with members of the establishment. However, when the police finally did arrive at his former property, they discovered a 15-year-old girl whom Gad had been living with. Not knowing that the game was up, Gad attempted to flee the country, but was detained by authorities at Tan Son Nat International Airport in Ho Chi Minh City as he attempted to board a flight to Bangkok. Gary, mate, I don't understand how you don't have a better exit plan. You've literally spent time in prison before and you could have negated some of that situation and you're like no 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 it's fine i don't i don't like have a well i'm not going to give any more advice to like gary glitter criminals trying to escape but how are you so ill prepared gary <laughs> how are you not accepting that at some point you're gonna have to have your face changed and go and live in like the australian outback or something or in alaska as the fact that Gad was under investigation became public knowledge, six females between the ages of 11 and 23 told authorities that he had had sex with them. As two of the girls were under the age of consent in Vietnam, incidentally that age is 18, and the 11-year-old girl was still legally and actually a child, Gad would, if found guilty, be executed by firing squads. Holy shit, dude. And you know, you're in a country where the crimes that you're doing can get you shot. And you're like, should be fine. <laughs> What the fuck you up to, Gary? For a short while, this looked highly likely as Gad openly admitted that the 11-year-old girl had shared his bed. Gary, did you have a lawyer or did you just smoke crack the day you were interviewed? What happened next requires a little bit of unpacking and analysis. First of all, the charge of child rape was dropped due to a lack of evidence. It was this charge that carried the death penalty in Vietnam at the time. Although it in itself is not particularly suspicious, it would later emerge that the families of both girls received a large payout from Gad that would, and would plead for clemency on his behalf. Well, that's, that's, um, that's fucked up. Some of the biggest pieces of shit I've ever met are parents. It is this that I ra find rather suspicious. Oh, you do, Dave. <laughs> I wonder why you find that suspicious. Although I was unable to find any evidence to support my theory, I believe, and again, this is just my opinion, that the large cash payout may have caused some sort of amnesia for the victim. I w how would a cash payout cause amnesia, Dave? Why would you even speculate that, Dave? I w <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Why would you draw that conclusion? That's sarcasm, allegedly. The amnesia would, of course, prevent her from successfully testifying against Gad. It certainly would not be the first time that something like this had happened, and I'm sure it wouldn't be the last. And I'm sure it's all just a big coincidence. Nevertheless, Gad would not entirely escape justice. On the 3rd of March 2006, he was found guilty of committing obscene acts with two girls, one aged 10 and the other 11 and was handed a three-year prison sentence. During the sentencing, the judge said he sexually abused and committed obscene acts with children many times in a disgusting and sick manner. 
Not only did Dad Gad continue to proclaim his innocence, regularly stating that he had been set up by the tabloid press, he also told several reporters that he fully intended to resume his music career in England once he left prison. Yeah, good luck with that, mate. No one's gonna want you to perform it. You're not gonna be able to perform at weddings, mate. What the fuck are you thinking? <laughs> He told The Telegraph, I have an incomplete album that I want to finish. I've been thinking about the plan during my days in jail. I've sung rock and roll for 40 years. After jail, I will continue to rock and roll. Yeah, privately, because no one's going to be hiring you. After his release in 2008, he immediately received a police escort straight to the airport where he was scheduled to be put back on a plane to England. It was like that guy, that Charles Chabrot guy or whatever. He was released from prison and sent back to France. And he was just sitting on a plane just next to some woman like this. And he killed. He was like the, the backpack murderer or whatever. I think we made a video about him. He killed a bunch of people, allegedly. I, that, wait, he was in prison, so I don't think I have to say allegedly there, but whatever. And he was sitting on this plane, <laughs> just in economy, next to some other people. It's like, oh no, it's him. You know, just sitting on a plane, just coming back from like, a nice holiday in Vietnam, chilling by the beach, eating some pho. And then you're like, oh, oh, is that Gary? <laughs> oh no, Gary. <laughs> You don't get to be starstruck. Things did not quite work out that way, at least not straight away. Gad was somehow able to board a flight to Thailand, but upon arrival, he was refused admission into the country on the grounds that he was a threat to domestic morality. Good. He told that he was told that if he did not leave voluntarily, he'd be detained and deported. Following this setback, he took a flight to Hong Kong, where upon the authorities refused him admission to the country, and he returned to Thailand on the very next flight. He's going to be like that terminal guy, just bouncing back and forth between countries until he dies. Uh, somewhat unsurprisingly, being refused admission to countries became somewhat of a regular occurrence for Gad with approximately 20 different locations, making it abundantly clear that should he attempt to travel there, he would be sent straight back. He's British, right? He's still British. He didn't get his Vietnam... Oh, well, that's just residency. So if he goes to the UK, they can't refuse him entry, can they? Because he's a British citizen. They'll just be like, okay, Gary, I guess we have to take you. Can your own country refuse you admission? I don't think, if you don't have a passport for somewhere else, I don't think so, right? Left with absolutely no options at all, he'd eventually return to England on the 22nd of August 2008. Well, there you go. As soon as his feet touched the tarmac, he was met by an honor guard of police constables who took him away for a little bit of a friendly chat. So whilst he was still in prison, the then Home Secretary, Jackie Smith, had said that as soon as he returned to the UK, he'd be placed on the sex offenders register for life. It was the job of the aforementioned police constables to ensure that this happened. Smith also said at the time that Gad should be prevented from traveling overseas. She told the press that we need to control him and he will be controlled once he returns to this country. Whilst I do not know whether this travel ban was ever put into place, I can find no record of him leaving the country after this point which is like <laughs> that's good i'm glad uh, this makes sense with the like does your country with that you're uh, a citizen of have to take you back because yeah it's like someone has to control you otherwise you're just gonna like live in some sort of legal limbo around the world committing horrible crimes so good let's put one of those gps trackers in his bones and uh, make sure he just never never leaves ideally his house but uh, he's not he's served all his time at this point right that's gonna change which is nice. Operation Yew Tree. I don't know much about yew trees. I know this is sorry, this is an extremely boring tangent. I remember we moved into a new house when I was a kid, and there were these giant, like, kind of beautiful yew trees in the garden. But they were apparently poisonous, and we were children, so my parents chopped them down, and uh, there were no more yew trees. Trees. Fascinating tangent, Simon. Thanks for that. That was amazing. All remained quiet on the Gad front for a couple of years after his release. He did not, as far as I can tell, relaunch his music career, go on a tour, or even finish his album. Instead, he seemed destined to vanish into obscurity. He was just another disgraced celebrity whose name would only appear in newspapers when it was time to report his death. But neither the... <laughs> Excellent. But neither the law nor the tabloids were finished with Gad, not by a long shot. On the 3rd of October 2012, ITV broadcast a documentary which uncovered years of horrific sexual abuse by both former and current celebrities. Is this the thing that got Jimmy Savile? Although the documentary was mostly focused on the alleged crimes of Jimmy Savile, and I only use the words allegedly as due to the fact that he passed away before the documentary was aired, he was never able to stand trial for his crimes, the documentary also made accusations against a number of other individuals including Paul Gad. Okay, um, I didn't realize that to say allegedly in front of, uh, Jimmy Savile's <laughs> crimes. <laughs> oh, Jimmy Savile, though, in my opinion, f*** you, you sick f 
allegedly. Uh, as a direct result of this documentary, Operation Newtree was launched. As previously mentioned, it was an investigation by the Metropolitan Police into cases of historical sex abuse committed by individuals in the public eye. According to an article in the Daily Mirror, Operation Newtree had three strands. One that concerned Savile's crimes exclusively, another relating to allegations against Savile and others, and the third one concentrating on other accusations that emerged as a result of the publicity surrounding Savile. This is like the original Me Too, except for like, as you'll find out, children. Gad was the first individual to receive a knock at the door from investigating officers. He was arrested during the second half of 2012 and was later released after questioning. In June 2014, Gad would be formally charged with, with eight sexual offenses, and by the time these charges went to uh, court, the number had risen to ten. The court case itself contained some truly harrowing witness testimony. One victim, who went on to become a nurse, testified from behind a screen in order to maintain her anonymity. She told the jury that when she was eight years old, Gad had picked her up in his Rolls Royce and taken her to a party at a fancy mansion. That night, as she slept, Gad had climbed into her bed. When asked to describe what happened next, she told the court, I didn't like him being there. It felt strange that he would have. It just felt strange to an adult in our bed. It hasn't happened before, and it just felt uncomfortable. After cuddling for a while, Gad then proceeded to rape her. I just felt like I was going to burst. It was a really intense ache. I felt like something was just going to break and it was me. I just wanted to get away. I felt ashamed and embarrassed. By that age, all your private areas become private. If anyone gets exposed, it's embarrassing. He hadn't seen me, but he had felt me, which is worse. Jesus. That is... Mm. During the call, I don't like this. It's like, I remember I once went to, when I was uh, studying law, I once went to like the... It was the uh, the appeals court, and they were hearing someone's appeal. They bring this guy in, and he sits in the the little chamber thing. I can't remember what it's called. And these judges are like reading, and I was like, "Oh my god, what have I come to?" And the judges like read out all of this stuff from the first case, and he was like some sick fuck sex offender, like nasty shit. And the judges are reading all of this stuff that he did, and I was like, "Oh my god, what am I doing here? <laughs> like, why? This is horrible." Um, but yeah. Yeah, and it was stuff like this, but even worse, man. Like, I mean, there's, there's, you don't want to put on a scale because I, I think what we're seeing here is like there's lots of horrible stuff, and because Dave doesn't knows that I don't want to read it, we're seeing you know just a limited amount. Not that this isn't fucking horrible, but <sighs> I don't know. I'm just gonna stop and move on. During the court case, many other similar stories of sexual depravity would emerge. I have made the decision not to include any more of them for two reasons. Firstly, I don't want to make Simon read them out. And secondly, although I believe it is important that these people's stories are heard, the testimony I've already included more than gets the point across. Exactly. Thank you. Gad will eventually be found guilty of attempted rape, four counts of indecent assault, and one of having sex with a girl under 13, and sentenced to 16 years in prison, the maximum sentence that could be handed down for these offences at the time. During sentencing, Judge Alistair McCreeth said that there was no real evidence that Gad had atoned for his crimes. In fact, he still maintains his innocence to this day. Early release. Now we come to a somewhat peculiar and much debated piece of British legal legislation. Even though Gad had been sentenced to 16 years, at the time of his sentencing, the law stated that such offenders could be released on license after having served half of the custodial sentence. This law was amended in 2002 and now means that offenders who have committed crimes similar to those of Gad must serve at least two-thirds of their allotted sentence behind bars. However, as is the case with most laws, it cannot be applied retrospectively, and so it was that on the 3rd of February 2023, Paul Gad was released from His Majesty's Prison, the Verd, and transported to a secure hostel in Purbrook, Portsmouth. It may be unwise to mention this, as it increases the chance that I may be tracked down by angry viewers, <laughs> but the hostel in question is only a short drive from where I currently live. Oh, no, short drive's fine. Like, if you're saying this, like, I'm pretty careful, like... I don't mention the street I live on and shit, but like, I live in Prague. People know I live in Prague. Like, I probably mentioned a few things, like, about the area I live, but, or where my office is. Um, it's fine. Like, it's fine. Don't worry, Dave. You'll be fine. If Dave gets murdered, it's not my fault. I've, of course, contacted the hostel in the hopes of getting some sort of comments, but I was told in no uncertain terms that Gad will not be talking to any reporters. After further. <laughs> shocking. <laughs> After further investigation, I discovered that this is one of the terms of his license. As is always the case when dealing with such individuals, the public are not exactly pleased that this prolific sex offender has taken up residence in their midst, especially as his current residence is within walking distance of about 10 schools. The police have been called to the property on more than one occasion to disperse crowds of angry protesters. One of these protesters, local construction worker, David Jones told reporters, We're spending all kinds of money to protect a paedophile like that. He should have died in prison. And 
while David, I 100% see where you're coming from, um, it's just not how justice works. I, I agree he should, I, I'd like to see him in, in prison for 16 years. Um, and I wouldn't be upset if he had died in prison, but that's not the world we live in. And yeah, we can't just have him killed by a mob. And fortunately <laughs> the ministry of justice has responded to this public outcry by saying sex offenders like paul gad are closely monitored by the police and probation service and face some of the strictest license conditions including being fitted with a gps tag excellent if the offender breaches these conditions at any point they can go back behind bars a response that seems to have done little to alleviate public concern nevertheless until gad can find a more private residence that fits with the restrictions placed upon him by his terms of license it looks like the people of portsmouth are stuck with him for the foreseeable future and then someone else is going to be stuck with him aren't they unless he goes and lives in his boat in international waters again where he belongs cases such as this often spark lively debate within the music world although gad's crimes were undoubtedly horrific many people argue about whether or not Many people argue about whether or not music that people such as he created should be tarnished along with them. All of Gad's music has been blacklisted on every single radio station in the United Kingdom, but should this be the case? Personally, I believe that publicizing the music of these criminals brings them undeserved glory and recognition. Having said that, I do miss the music of the Lost Prophets. Wait, what's the Lost Prophets? Oh my god, is that the guy who raped? Or like, I don't know, didn't he do something horrible? Yes, he did. Was that the Lost Prophets? Okay. And genuinely feel sorry for the band members who are not Ian Watkins, a truly despicable human being. You should probably also be granted the dubious honor of a casual criminalist video. So, what is the answer to this question? Well, according to brothers Richard and Fred Fairbrass, better known as Right Said Fred, songs shouldn't be attached to the singers to a singer's racism or sexual related problems. They at least are of the firm opinion that music and artist can and should be separated. I don't really have an answer to this question. I just thought that it might make for an interesting topic of debate in the comment section. Yeah, it's so hard. I was I'm such a or I was, I don't know. I don't even know how to describe it now. Like Kevin Spacey was one of my favorite actors. Like some of the movies that he's he's done, um American Beauty, Margin Call, uh the television show um where he's the president some of the uh, he's just a brilliant actor and now it's weird so <laughs> yeah don't really know how to feel about that which is the debate isn't it uh anyway that's where we're going to end today's video thank you so much for being here for watching for listening and i'll see you in the next one